Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to LibertyCon 2019. Where the movement gathers to reflect on our history, where we are today, and what the future holds. So sit back, relax, and get ready for a jam-packed, exciting, challenging, and invigorating weekend. Now, please welcome to the stage our MC for the evening, Miss Gloria Alvarez. Welcome to Liberty Con 2019. How's everyone doing? My name is Gloria Alvarez, and I'm so excited to be with you guys this weekend. Let's start by giving Students for Liberty a huge round of applause for this amazing event. So it is always amazing to think that this conference first started like 10 years ago with only 100 or so attendees. Now the conference happens annually and it has brought together thousands and thousands of people over that time. One of the reasons for SFL's success as of late is the dedication and commitment of its CEO, Wolf von Lahr. Let's please welcome him now to the stage, Dr. Wolf von Lahr. Destruction, war, economic turmoil, poverty, mass migration, and an utterly divided political class that has spent its time just fighting and bickering every single day. That is what we see if we switch on the news. That is that what we see when we open up the newspaper. This is how the world is portrayed to us, but this is not the truth. Tonight, I will make the case to you that the world is getting better. Not everywhere, not always in the same way, but it is indeed getting better. However, there is a lot of work to be done, and it has to start with us. This is the other point that I want to make tonight to you. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to LibertyCon 2019. I want to thank you all for coming. We will probably have more than 1,000 folks here over the next couple of days. And you're coming from here in the United States, but from all around the world. And I do appreciate you because it means that you want to learn more about the ideas. It means that you want to engage in civil discourse. And this is all only possible because of all the great exhibitors that we have here and partner organizations that partner with us. And I want to thank all of them, and specifically Reason, Google, Bitcoin.com, and The Washington Times. <laughs> but now, let me tell you why the world is getting better. And let me start with an example. Because in 1978, it was the first time that China opened up their very, very rigid communist economy. They didn't do it completely, they're still heavily controlled, but they just did it a little bit. And it was enough for entrepreneurs to step in and to create products in the marketplace and serve customers. And within a very short time span, span in just a couple of decades, more than a billion of people have been lifted out of absolute poverty. And this has happened in India, and it's happening in India, and in many other countries around the world. And the data is showing that. In the year 1820, 94% of the world's population lived in absolute poverty. Literally everyone in this room would live in absolute poverty, which is defined as having less than $2 a day to spend. Now, fast forward. In the 18, uh, 1980s, 
Nearly half of the world was still in poverty. Every second person in this room would live in absolute poverty. Now, since 2018, it is 8.6% of people who live in absolute poverty. Still too much, but it's a much better world. And it's remarkable because think about this. This is just data, but imagining the billions of people, the billions of families that now have a choice to see their daughter, their son go to school, go to university, instead of seeing them toiling on the fields and maybe, maybe even dying by the age of 25. And this is truly remarkable. And we see many things improving as well. E economic, uh, no, illiteracy generally is, is receding, diseases are receding, and so is poverty in general. However, these things don't make the news. However, they're gradual, relentless, and good. We see life expectancy going up. We see that there are fewer assaults, sexual assaults going on. We see there are fewer people now, victims of violence or victims of natural disaster. All of that is being shown at data, and we can take pride in this because we, as pro-liberty advocates, can explain this. We can say this is due to the rule of law, markets, property rights, and people being free to choose. And virtually no economist would disagree with that because if you have economic freedom, you would have economic prosperity. Happiness will go up, life expectancy will go up, tolerance will go up, and all of that is correlated. Again, is it perfect? Is it homogeneous? Is it everywhere? No. But we see this trend, and it's something that we need to celebrate. However, I'm the first to admit it's not perfect either. If you look at these countries, we, had, we have seen recently some successes with pushing back the regulatory state and we have seen some eh, semi-decent tax reform. However, we also see stupid, stupid trade wars which harm the American people and people all around the world. And we see an utterly divided political class that cannot even talk to one another anymore. More importantly though, in the last decade, we see most industrial countries not support free market economic policies anymore. And we do know that young people specifically have given up on the free market. Their support of the free market is declining rapidly, and we see this every single day in Students for Liberty. That's the reason I'm so excited that you are here, because I think the movement has been growing, and we can push back against that. But we have to look at ourselves first, because it's so easy to just wag the finger and point out everything that's wrong with the world and blaming others. And it's very easy to say, Oh, the world would be so much better if everybody would have read Mises' Human Action or Hayek's Road to Serfdom or Atlas Shrug. Then the world would be so much better. Why can they not just read that stuff? And many people from the left and the right do the same thing, just pointing the finger. And that is the wrong approach. Because then we display ourselves as a victim, as the victim of the others, the victim of government or the victim of society in general. But we, as pro-liberty advocates, understand it's liberty and it's responsibility. So let me tell you a story who's of someone who took his responsibility seriously. His name is Khalid, and he's a personal hero of mine. Khalid lives in Afghanistan, a war-torn place, violence on a daily basis, a lot of turmoil. But he's not complaining, he is taking action. So he organized the first ever Students for Liberty conference in Kabul. And while there were bad circumstances, he still made it happen. There was actually a lot of traffic on the roads and they had to push back the event for like one or two hours because there was a suicide bomber that led to the traffic. We cannot imagine circumstances like this, but he called everyone up and made them come to that event so that they can talk about the ideas of liberty in the same way that we are talking about the ideas of liberty here tonight. And that is just remarkable. And many people don't agree with him in his society, of course, either. Same as your campus or in your community or with your family. But he goes out there. He has a smile on his face. He works every day hard. He has a beautiful family. And even though people disagree with him, he stands behind his principles. And that demands respect. So people cannot just dismiss him. and compare that to a younger version of myself. Because when I first discovered the ideas of liberty, I read everything that I could. 
And I was so excited about the ideas. And I thought, I found the truth. I know it all now. And I had the perspective that if somebody disagreed with me and advocated for policy X, it would mean that they would advocate violence against me. While that is theoretically correct, it was not very productive. I came across as self-righteous. I was not listening to people. I was just saying, like, but how could you do this? And I know that I've pushed people away from the ideas that I hold so, so dear. But hopefully I've learned one or two things since then. I've improved myself, tried to become a better communicator, and that starts with listening to others, trying to understand where they're coming from, what are their values, what are their goals, and how does it compare to the goals that we as pro-liberty advocates have. That's how we truly make a difference in this world, by focusing first and foremost on us instead of others. Because there's so much that we can do better as pro-liberty advocates right now. Because if a person becomes good enough and we become interesting enough and we're doing cool stuff, other people will come to us and seek our advice. However, if nobody is coming to us and asking for advice or how do you believe we could fix poverty in America and nobody asks us any of these questions, then there's still homework to be done. And I believe we can reverse that trend that young people believe more and more into socialism if we do this. And we can reverse this trend with the liberty movement because it has grown considerably. Because just 50 years ago, there was just the Cato Institute, the Fund for American Studies, the Institute for Main Studies, and the Foundation for Economic Education. Now, just look at this exhibit hall. It's dozens of dozens of organizations. One of our favorite partners is the Atlas Network, and they have grown from 60 partner organizations to 484 here in the United States and around the world. All organizations that work towards more liberty in their country. We know that the State Policy Network now works with think tanks in every single state in the US and fighting for free market policies. And we do see this also in Students for Liberty. Now, I would like to ask all of the volunteer student leaders to please rise up of Students for Liberty. Yes, you, you, all the volunteers. <laughs> These are young individuals often not even 20 years old. But last year, they organized, in a single year, 1,482 events with 65,180 people. That's more events and attendees in a single year than in the last 10 years combined of Students for Liberty's history. And that's what young people can accomplish. That's what you also can accomplish being in this room. So please, enjoy this conference, improve yourself, and spread a positive view of our ideas. Thank you very much, and have a good night. Thank you, Wolf. It's now my pleasure to introduce a legend in the libertarian movement. Our next speaker is Arthur Brooks, president of the American Enterprise Institute, Dr. Brooks is a contributing opinion writer for the New York Times, host of the podcast, The Arthur Brooks Show, and the best-selling author of 11 books on topics including role of government, economic opportunity, happiness, and the morality of free enterprise. His next book, Love Your Enemies, and a feature-length documentary, The Pursuit, will be released in March 2019. Now, before Arthur takes the stage, we are delighted to share with you a trailer of The Pursuit. This feature-learned film is the culmination of three years of research, conversations, and travel across three continents to seek an answer to the question, how can we lift up the world, starting with those at the margins of society? Along the way, it reveals the secrets not only to material progress, for the least fortunate, but also greater happiness for all people. For more information on the film and screenings in your area, please visit thepursuitmovie.com. Please join me to welcome Arthur Brooks. 
I don't claim to have all the answers, but the answers that I've found have truly changed my life. Arthur Brooks, sir. Thank you, Mr. President. It's an honor to be here and with all of you. Poverty is the thing I care about the most. I think that the suspicion that people have about capitalism comes because they think people like me don't believe in morals and they don't believe in any regulation at all. And that's not true. Here's the great irony of our times. People in the wealthiest countries in the world are increasingly turning against the very system that's lifted us out of poverty. If India had not adopted economic reforms, there would be 375 million poor people more in the country today. Whatever we gotta do to get the American dream honestly, then that's what we're gonna do, you know? The American dream is always predicated on you work hard, you get the right grade, you go to the right schools, and a lot of time, it doesn't work that way. The real poverty exists when a young man or a young woman grows up with no dream. That's poverty, man. You know, coal goes away, what are we gonna do? They didn't think about that. They didn't expect it. They didn't expect it. Two billion people have been pulled out of starvation level poverty. What did that? Everyone want happy life, do not want suffering. You are showing genuine interest, not only money matter, but more wider perspective. I really very much appreciate. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Your Holiness. The point of the American experience is a moral consensus that our society should push opportunity to the people who need it the most. Ladies and gentlemen, what an honor it is to be with you. Thank you for watching that trailer. I'm so excited to show the rest of the film to you. Anybody who wants to see it, it's coming out soon. Um, and I've been looking forward to this, looking forward to talking to a room full of people fighting for liberty, fighting for what we have to value the most, that is the, the possibility and promise of people who come after us. Thank you for doing that. It's a mission, and it's a mission that you can live up to, and so can I. And that's what I want to talk about tonight. You know, I have strong opinions <laughs> on politics. I have strong opinions on social issues. So do you. But you know the thing I hate about America today right now is that we are being told that we have to hate each other, especially people who disagree with us. I bet every single one of you agrees with me that you should be able to hold your opinions and still love others who don't hold those opinions. How are you going to do that? Well, I'm going to give you some ideas about how you can be at the vanguard of the movement to bring America together. Wouldn't it be wonderful if the people who have the mission of the liberty movement were the missionaries for bringing the country back together again? That can be our cause, and this can be a new day. But we have to know how. You know, when I, I, I watch the, the bitter debates that are going on today, I remember when I first had this big epiphany. You know, I, I run the American Enterprise Institute. I'm a, I'm a think tank president, so I, I travel around for a living. I, I give 175 speeches a year. It's a great life. I talk on left-wing college campuses, and I talk to conservative activist events and, and everything in between. And I was in New Hampshire in 2014 giving a speech to a conservative group it's about 700 conservative activists. I mean, super fired up, three-cornered hats, the whole deal. And, and, and I, I remember I was the only non-politician on the speaking docket. I got there a little bit early to kind of get my bearings and listen to some people. They were all politicians. Most of them wanted to run for president, Republican president. And, you know, they were doing what politicians always do. They were throwing stakes out into the audience. Like, the people on the other side, they're, they're stupid. The people on the other side have evil ideas, the whole thing, just getting people really emotional. And I thought to myself, you know, I don't have to run for anything. <laughs> I'm, I'm not a public official. I don't need votes. So I'm going to see what I can do to make this better. Hmm. So I thought about it, and I, got, I cooked up this little thing I was going to say in the middle of my speech. And, you know, this was, I was giving a talk about economic policy or something, and, and, and you know, about how we need to let people keep what they earn and earn success and how dignity comes from work. And, 
In the middle, I stopped and I said, but you know, I agree with pretty much all of you in this audience, but I want you to remember that there are a lot of people here or who are not here because they don't agree with us. Who are they? They're political progressives. And I want you to remember, my friends, that they're not stupid and they're not evil. They're just Americans who disagree with us. Now, I knew that wasn't going to be an applause line. <laughs> but here was not, here's what I was not expecting. A very nice lady, I'm sure, uh, said, I think they're stupid and evil. <laughs> and she wasn't trying to offend me. She was making a joke, right? But you know what I thought of at that moment? I thought of Seattle. Why? Because it's my hometown. I grew up in a progressive family in Seattle, Washington, which is redundant. Because <laughs> they all are, you know? <laughs> but when that lady said that, she was talking about my family. And I took it personally. At that moment, I had a big epiphany that I want to share with you. What we're being told in this country by people on TV and people in politics and people in entertainment and, and people on college campuses is that we should reject, we should repudiate people that we love. Question for you, show of hands. How many of you love somebody with whom you disagree politically? Thank God, it's 100%. I'm gonna round it off to 100%. <laughs> Close enough. That's the country I want to live in. And that's the country you want to live in, too. Here's the mark of moral courage. Not standing up to the other side. and standing up to your side when they, when they insult people on the other side. That's what our movement can do. Because that's what liberty can do. It gives you the liberation to do that. Question is, how? Huh, it's tricky, isn't it? Hard thing to do. If you're on a college campus or... If you're in pretty much any place, it's hard to stand up your own side. So let's start by asking, what motivates this tendency that we have to hate each other so much over politics? It's the worst it's been in my lifetime, yours too. What motivates that? And the answer is not anger. You know, you hear the political politics too angry today, it's wrong. Paul, anger is no problem. The problem is what psychologists call contempt. Contempt is the conviction of the utter worthlessness of another human being. And, and that's what we hear every day. I have a friend, his name is John Gottman. He's the world's leading expert in marital reconciliation. He has a thing called the Gottman Marriage Laboratory in Seattle, Washington, at the University of Washington. And John Gottman, he says that he can counsel a couple that's, having, that's quarreling, having trouble, and he can predict with 97% accuracy if they will be divorced within a, a face in your head, right? It's wrong. Because you just got in a face in your head of somebody you disagree with. <laughs> the people you need to stand up to and turn off are the people you agree with, but who are actually profiting from our terrible climate of contempt. Make a list of those people and cross them out of your life. Cross them out of your reading. Cross them out of your media consumption. Declare your independence. That's homework assignment number one. Homework assignment number two is seek out contempt. You know, usually when it's something that's unpleasant, you want to run the other direction, right? But that's wrong. I've, I've met a lot of really courageous people who are religious missionaries. What a hard job, you know? There's a missionary on the porch. Pretend we're not home. There's a lot of rejection. <laughs> so I have a suggestion for religious missionaries. Only go to the houses where people are already converted. You'll probably get a sandwich. That's idiotic because you're going specifically to places where people haven't gotten the message. You believe in something. Let's not make this a religious metaphor. Let's make this a metaphor for what you believe is truth and what you believe is good and better for people, especially poor people. You need to share that, which means you need to go where people disagree with you and where you've not been invited. You need to go where people have contempt for you and have other people, including them, see you return their contempt with warm-heartedness. Couple of quick suggestions on how to do that, because it's not enough for, just for me to tell you to do that. How do you do it? Number one, make more friends with people on the other side, no matter what side you're on. Specifically, more good friends. Because if you do that, you're gonna get more ideas, and they're gonna get yours as well. If you don't have any friends who are not libertarians, you need to get out more. 
I mean, it's great that you're here because we need some sustenance. <laughs> but when you get back home, widen your circle of friendships. Number two, remember that guy John Gottman, that psychologist I told you about who brings couples back together? He has this technique that he uses for couples that are just about to split up. He calls it the five to one rule. He makes them carry around notebooks and they can't criticize each other until they've said five complimentary beautiful things to each other first. Follow the five to one rule, especially on social media. You don't get to say anything negative at all or anything critical until you've said five complimentary positive things first. By the way, by the time you get through that five, you won't remember your criticism you'll be a more positive person. This is how you find contempt and answer contempt with warm heartedness. And the last piece of, of advice I wanna give to you, no, homework I wanna give to you, is to practice gratitude. You know, that's, that was the secret. You know, my, my guy in Dallas, I accidentally just said thank you. Thank you for writing to me. Thank you for reading my book. You know, there's a, a great study from the University of California, Santa Barbara, where psychologists, they took two groups of undergraduates and they assigned randomly one to make a list of current events and the other to make a list of the things they were grateful for. And they had to review their list every day and every Sunday they had to update it. At the end of 10 weeks, the gratitude listers were 25% happier than the current events listers. Friends, that's free. You get to do that. You get a 25% boost in your happiness by simply counting your blessings, and there are so many. You should be grateful to live in a country that's free in most ways, where you can come to this and there's no knock in the night and there's no jackbooted thug, where we can disagree politically. You should be grateful for the people on the other side because there is another side, and in so many countries around the world, there isn't another side. Gratitude is the right reaction. It's, it only makes sense. There was a, a great book written in, the, in 1936 by a, a self, the, the, the self-improvement original guru, Dale Carnegie. He wrote How to Win Friends and Influence People. And then my favorite chapter of that book, it, it was just, it talked about secrets of success. He went to hit the, hit the most famous magician of the day and asked him for his secret to why he was considered the world's greatest performer a guy named Howard Thurston. He was performing on Broadway. He was finishing a 40-year career doing the same tricks eight times a week, rabbits out of hats, card tricks, the whole deal. And Dale Carnegie is out in the audience trying to figure out why he's considered such a great performer, and he figures it out. He, he, he is connected to his audience, and he thinks, this is amazing, eight shows a week for 40 years. How does he do it? So he goes back to Howard Thurston's dressing room afterward, and he said, What's your secret for staying in the game like this? For staying so connected to those people because that's why they love you. And he said this, every night before I go out on stage, I say this to myself, quote, I am grateful because these people came to see me. They make it possible for me to make my living in a very agreeable way. I'm going to give them the very best that I possibly can. But then it gets better. Before he'd hit the footlights, right before he went out on stage, he would say this to himself, to himself, I love my audience. I love my audience. That had such a big impact on me when I read it years and years and years ago. You know what I said to myself before I came out here tonight? And it's true, I do love you. Because I'm making my living right now. I get to go to Liberty Con, and I get to talk about something that's important to me, and I get to talk about how we can be better and we can win as a force for good. You're making that possible for me, and I'm truly grateful to you. So here's my last word, my friends. And then I turn back the, turn back the stage over to the, the folks that are going to entertain you for the rest of the evening tonight. You know, um, I talked about a couple of times about the mission spirit, <laughs> about changing hearts and changing minds toward the things that we know are not just good for us, but are good for everybody, especially the people at the periphery of our society who need us the most. That's the reason that liberty really matters. Not for us in this room, but for them who can't be here. That's the spirit of service. And I talked about how missionaries think about this with a very special zeal. This is not a religious idea. And so here's the, I want to leave you with one image of this. <clears throat> There's a, 
a, a, a retreat center near my home. And my wife and I, we teach young couples, you know, 20, 25 or 30 young couples a month. We talk to them about marriage preparation. They're engaged. You know, we've married, my wife and I have been married for 28 years. We got a little bit of experience under our belts. Give them some ideas, right? And it's a, it's a, it's a religious uh, center. And I noticed one time as I was leaving that there was a sign over the door. Not when you come in, but when you're leaving. It's for people who are in this religious retreat center to read before they go out into the parking lot. You know what it said? You are now entering mission territory. I thought to myself, that's not just a religious message. That's a message for anybody who thinks that they can serve others better and who want to lift people up and bring them together with truth. Now, so what I want you to do, if you want to put these ideas into action, I want you to burn something into your brain. I want, to, I want a message that you can remember. So what I want you to do is, I want you to imagine that there's a sign over each one of these doors. You who love liberty and want to share it, when you leave through these doors tonight, the last thing for you to remember is that when you leave LibertyCon, you are now entering mission territory. God bless you and thank you. Thank you, Arthur. So you may have noticed a ticket on your seat. It was provided by Bitcoin.com. Bitcoin.com is giving everyone in the audience free Bitcoin cash. So yeah, <laughs> download the Bitcoin.com wallet from wallet.bitcoin.com and scan the QR and you can receive up to $100 in Bitcoin cash. Yep. Who's inviting for the drinks tonight? Um, as many of, of you know, the U.S. government is still in shutdown, so unfortunately, Ajit Pai... Okay, you're excited about that. <laughs> so, Ajit Pai can no longer join us this evening because of it, but we will have Catherine Manguward interviewing Congressman Amash in just a bit. But before that... You're so excited tonight. Before that, we uh, bring them, uh, you know, please help me welcome Lou Perez. Is this thing on? Whoa, thank you guys so much. I, I gotta say, I feel a little bad because after that amazing presentation by Arthur Brooks, positivity so much, I come out dressed like Satan which I think actually the real Satan is here somewhere, if I have my things right. Actually, I feel like I'm, I'm actually supposed to be doing comedy for you, but the way that I'm dressed right now, I feel like I should be selling you a new cryptocurrency. <laughs> Something called, I don't know, like douche dimes. <laughs> I'm, really, um, I'm really bummed that a Jeep pie uh, couldn't be here. Um, I know we're, we're very happy about the government shutdown, but as a comedian, I wanted to perform in front of the head of the FCC, right? But I guess now that he's not here, I can say fuck all I want. I don't have to worry about getting fined or bleeped or anything like that. Uh, I wanted to thank him though for all the work that he did defeating net neutrality. I think that was fantastic. Yeah, thank you fellas. You know, we're like a, a year into this thing, and the fellas, we all know, the porn has not slowed down. <laughs> yes. Yes. And we have not paid for any of it. Socialized porn. That's what it's about. Although there's one thing I, want, I would really love to talk to Ajit Pai about, and the FCC in general. Um, I would really love for them to regulate uh, mean comments on YouTube because I get a lot of them. <laughs> Very mean comments on YouTube. I know some of you guys here are making those mean comments about me <laughs> on YouTube. The other day I got a comment. The guy said, whoa, check out the ghost of Billy Mays. <laughs> you guys all know who Billy Mays is? OxyClean Billy Mays? 
You know, and I was so pissed off because never in my life, like I've been called so many different things online, but that was the most specific thing, <laughs> the ghost of Billy Mays. And I was so upset for so long, but then I thought about, well, wait a minute, hold on, hold on, hold on. I'm not gonna take that as an insult. I mean, let's be real. You don't sell all that OxyClean without sex appeal. Like, I don't know how good that shit is at cleaning or removing stains, but Billy, he's selling you the fantasy. <laughs> right? You come home after a long day of work, you straddle up to that washing machine you got, and there's Billy waiting for you. He takes you into his arms, and then, oh, is that my cheek against his beard? feels so good. You know how good it feels? For the first time in your life, you feel like you're worth two easy payments of $19.95. Ah! <laughs> oh, the man's a legend. We miss you, Billy. This one's for you. <laughs> the people who booked me had no idea Billy Mays was going to be such a large part of my presentation. <laughs> but why not? Another thing I'm a little, uh, little, little tired about, Arthur Brooks was, was talking about, you know, just how cruel we are to one another. And um, so I'm just gonna come right on and say it. Uh, can you guys stop calling me a cuck? <laughs> Seriously, and for those of you who don't know what a cuck is, a cuck is short for cuckold, which is a man who lets other men have sex with his wife. Now, first off, that sounds really hot. Okay. <laughs> Second off, I'm only six months into my, into my marriage, okay? We're not there yet. <laughs> but if any of you young, young, handsome libertarians want to give your resume, there may be an internship down the road. <laughs> but, you got, hey, man, in this economy, you got to see what your options are. That's all I'm saying. That's all I'm saying. I, uh, I am married, uh, it's, uh, anybody here married? I mean, you guys are all pretty young. Uh, yeah, woo, yeah. Um, we're, we're married and we're starting to learn a lot of things about each other, my wife and I. And what I'm learning is that I annoy her a lot <laughs> and I'm learning that I get annoyed when she points out that I annoy her a lot. And, and one, of the things, one of the things that, that she gets so annoyed with me about is that I like to piss in the shower. Come on, come on. Fellas, come on. You know how much fun it is to be standing, facing the toilet, but aiming for the shower. God made us that way. He did. But, but you know, I mean, she has her faults too. Like, there's something that I learned in our relationship when summertime comes around and I get sunburnt on my shoulders, I have to leave the dead skin for her. She's a peeler, guys. She's a peeler and she attacks that shit like and peels the skin on my shoulders like she's gonna find a better man under there. <laughs> but she ain't, she's not gonna find a better man right there. All she's going to be left with is this libertarian wearing an $80 suit he got off of Amazon. Yeah! Thank you. I am part of the reason why the poverty is going down in China. That's all I'm saying. $80 at a time. You're welcome to our Chinese brothers and sisters over there. But I am, I am a, a libertarian and... Uh, I think Arthur was talking about just how great it feels when you're able to come into this warm community and, and, and we love seeing one another. But then we gotta go back you know, to our real lives. And me, I'm from New York, right? So that means that I am the only libertarian in New York <laughs> that I wanna hang out with. <laughs> Have you ever met a libertarian? Holy shit! I mean, you are these people, you know what I'm talking about, right? <laughs> Have you ever had a conversation with a libertarian? It does not feel voluntary. <laughs> Whoa! 
But I, I have a, I have this, I have this sim, this sign that I do with my friends, right? If I'm at an event and I'm in a conversation, I want to get out of, okay? And some of you guys will be the reason for it, <laughs> but others, I want you to save me, okay? So it's a really simple thing. All I do is I tug on my ear and go, "Kill me!" <laughs> and then you know it's time to save Lou from another conversation about Hayek. Like it's just time. <laughs> to save me from that conversation. You know, it could be lonely, it could be really lonely uh, being, a, you know, being a libertarian in New York, but, but I try to make friends, right? And I try to make friends with liberals as much as I can. I try it all the time to make li friends with liberals, and it's always the same story. I always go up to them, I'm like, oh, come on, guys. We agree on all the fun stuff. Drugs and prostitution. I, I just want you to buy your drugs and prostitutes with Bitcoin. Like, can we just do that? Or my crypto, douche dimes. That's, you know, I think douche dimes is going to stick. I think it's, there's going to be no, no bubble whatsoever with douche dimes. Whatsoever. Um, but w one of the greatest things about, you know, being a libertarian is that we know every four years, no matter what, we're going to be unhappy. And it's just beautiful just knowing that, just going through life like, hey, you know what, that is a constant. That's wonderful. <laughs> That's great. I have a lot of friends who, uh, who absolutely hate Donald Trump. Um, they can't stand him whatsoever. And, and, and my warning is like, look, look, look you, know, you don't have to like him, but you can't let him drive you crazy, right? That's so important. You gotta keep your head on. I have a buddy of mine, yesterday he's like, <laughs> Oh, look at Trump. He's so fat and ugly. I'm like, dude, you guys have the same body type. <laughs> at least Donald Trump is 72 years old. Motherfucker, you're 30 years old. <laughs> and let's not pretend that like under the Obama administration, you weren't a complete mess. <laughs> like, come on, man. If anything, my friend should be happy that Donald Trump is president. Why? Because Obama, Obama was tall, good-looking, charismatic. Under the Obama administration, my friend was what? Maybe a three? <laughs> but under Donald Trump, come on, the dude is gross. My friend could be a four <laughs> if he gets his shit together. Very important, very important about that. I don't know how you guys feel. Do you guys miss Obama at all? N no? I miss him a little bit. I can miss him. It's all right, I have a microphone. <laughs> I can miss him. I miss Obama because of the charisma, without a doubt. It was all about the charisma that, that got me. Um, I'm actually one of those people, when I heard about Obamacare, I thought it meant he was literally going to be my doctor. <laughs> he wasn't. He wasn't at all. I'm. Uh, you know, trying to bring people together as much as I can, and I think libertarians were in a great position to do that, right? Because we're so weird. And people are like, even if people are like, oh, that's my weirdo libertarian, I can't really get mad at them. It's wonderful, you can bring us together. And I think something, a real topic that, that we could really come together on is, uh, is climate change. Let me, let me explain. A lot of people were upset when Donald Trump pulled us out of the Paris Accord. A lot of people were upset about that. And a lot of people cheered it on. And I think one thing I can say is, whether you were for the Paris Accord or you were against the Paris Accord, the one thing we can all agree on is that none of us read it. <laughs> and that's beautiful, man. That's so beautiful. You guys are beautiful. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Enjoy the rest of the show. So Congressman Justin Amash, otherwise known as Liberty Man, has made his career in being a staunch defender of pro-liberty ideas. We're very excited to have Congressman Amash with us this evening, where he will be interviewed by Catherine Mangu Ward. Catherine is one of SFL's newest members of the Board of Directors and the Editor-in-Chief of Reason. Please join me in welcoming Congressman Justin Amash and Catherine Mangu Ward.
Yeah, we got Bitcoin on our chair. It's exciting. Thank you so much for joining me on stage, Congressman. Uh, my first question is, I actually have to ask, like, you were tweeting about Adele this afternoon, and so I just yeah. want to check, like, are you okay? I'm fine. I was just listening to Adele, and I had to say what was on my mind. I mean, it was a tweet about how she sounds better alone. Yeah. Okay, I just yeah, wanted I to think, check. I mean, I don't know what she was intending with the song, so okay. I don't know. Okay, but that's fine. He's I fine, think, I everyone. I think it's better when she's solo. He's not lonely. Um, so, <laughs> I guess... Uh, you're probably sick of talking about the shutdown, but too bad. We're going to talk about the shutdown. So uh, let's start there. Um, I noticed there was a, a smattering of applause for shutdowns out here. So let's start with that. Should libertarians love shutdowns? Uh, we should love limited government. We should love decreasing the size of government. I'm not sure that the shutdown persuades people to come in our direction. And I think a, a big part of what we need to do is persuade people. Um, so it's, it's always easy for us to go out and cheer for things like the government's not operating here or there. Um, and, and frankly, uh, by the way, most of the government is operating. So like, I, it's, it's exaggerated the extent uh, of what's shut down. About 85 to 90% of the government is operating and funded. Um, but I think when you've got the media reporting um, all these stories about how people are at home and not receiving their paychecks and other things, I don't think that brings people to our side. So um, this isn't the best way to persuade people by saying rah, 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 like it's so great to have a shutdown. Um, I, I, think, I think, I, now, uh, I don't support the appropriations that they're trying to bring back online. I think that a lot of that stuff could be eliminated from government, but we should do it in an orderly fashion. Um, I've suggested uh, to the Trump administration that they should open the government one week at a time and um, allow them to keep negotiating and maybe work on something better than what we'd otherwise get. Uh, right now, I think they're, that both sides are in a um, stalemate because neither one wants to have the big loss. So if, if there's long-term funding but there's no wall, then Trump gets a big loss. If there's long-term funding and there's a wall, then the Democrats suffer a big loss. Neither side wants that big loss. So to, the way to avoid the big loss is just do it one week at a time and keep negotiating and bring down the temperature. Does either side deserve the big loss? Does, uh, well, they both deserve to lose. I mean, <laughs> I mean these, uh, you know, like people ask me about the spending bill, um, and uh, at first I voted, uh, as the Democrats voted, I voted no on the spending bill because when Republicans were, were in control of the House, it included wall funding, and people thought, oh, uh, Justin's with us. The Democrats were like, Justin's with us, he's against the wall. And then when the Republicans, or when the Democrats took control, then I still voted no. And they're like, they were confused by this whole thing. Um, I'm against the funding overall. I think there's way too much spending. We're, we're debating a wall uh, that will be between zero and five billion dollars in the appropriations bill, or bills. And the overall funding is about 350 billion dollars. So we're talking about spending bills that are 350 billion dollars, and they're talking about zero to five billion. Um, we're spending, you know, tens of billions or maybe hundreds of billions too much on uh, these parts of government, but we're talking about this wall. So you uh, more than once have uh, gone on the record as a kind of pox on both your houses uh, on the yep. two parties, but I, I got to ask, like, you still live in one of those houses. Yeah, sadly. Uh, <laughs> Do you see it's a that? Very sad house. That's yes. why I'm listening to, to Adele. You know. That's right. It, it's driven you. It's driven you to power ballads. It's too bad. Um, do you see that changing anytime soon? I mean, who knows? Uh, I, I think one of the problems with um, our system right now is that the two parties control all the levers and they try to keep the other parties out. Um, I'd like to see uh, a more open system that allows third parties to compete. And I really do think. There's a lot of room right now for a strong third party. Um, I, yeah, I, I don't think, I frankly don't think most Americans like 
either the Republicans or the Democrats and would be happy to have some alternative to these parties. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, it would take, a, it would be a big move and, um, you know, who knows? You heard it here first. That sounded pretty awkward. Who knows? That's all I'll give you. Yeah. Why don't you, okay, let's, let's stay here for a quick second. Um, describe, if you would, an ideal third-party candidate for someone who might actually make some headway in the current electoral environment. Well, he, he wears Air Jordans and okay. um, he's- Okay, we're gonna lean into it. Uh, yeah. So, um, well, I think an ideal third party candidate, like especially a libertarian party candidate, I mean, that's what I'll talk about. I think the ideal candidate has to be very libertarian because if you're running in the libertarian party, you'd better be a libertarian. But it has to be a person who is uh, persuasive to other people, um, can bring Republicans and Democrats on board or bring a large part of the elector electorate on board. Because you can't just appeal to diehard libertarians and win the election. Um, I, I think that uh, too often uh, the party has made concessions to have more sort of squishy Republican candidates run as the Libertarian Party candidate, and then you destroy the Libertarian Party base. So you have to have, you have to have the, you have to have the base aligned with the candidate, but that candidate has to be appealing to people beyond the base. Uh, I think that's that's the way to uh, make the Libertarian Party more relevant, at least. Uh, I'll let you go ahead and do it if you want. You ready to announce? No, I'm not ready to announce All anything. Right. <laughs> I had to try, guys. I'm a journalist. It's my job. Um, so let's, let's back up a little bit. Um, every speaker of the House that you have worked under has hated your guts. Is yeah. that fair to say? Well, I don't, I don't think, um, I don't know that they've hated my guts. I mean, I had a very good relationship with John Boehner. But I think you once I told me say, he called you a word I'm pretty sure we're not allowed to say Yeah, yeah, he stage. said, I mean, but that's just how John Boehner okay, is. Okay, that's fine. That's a sign of affection. It's like, that's yeah. Fair. When he calls you like an a-hole and all these other things and five other words, it's just how he talks. Okay. But um, yeah, I think he liked me more than Paul Ryan liked me. But, um, but you know, Paul Ryan doesn't use language like that. Uh, and how are things going the last couple of weeks? So, um, I mean, it's hard to say. It, it hasn't <laughs> been good. I, I don't, <laughs> I haven't voted yes that many times um, since uh, Speaker Pelosi came into power. But um, I didn't vote yes that many times before either. There. Um, it's, you know, all the speakers are bad. I mean. Arthur the, Brooks the, came in here, by the way. He was so positive. He was so full of love. We're just up here like I think it's good. Sucks. I think it's good to be positive. I think it's good to have that positivity. And, and I heard a lot of what he had to say. And I, I think that's very good. Um, especially you're trying to reach out to other people and, and grow your base and bring people on board who otherwise disagree. But I think uh, part of the problem with politics is people aren't honest enough about what's going on. And there's a lot of bad going on. And l unless you can reckon with that bad stuff, you'll never get to the good stuff. You have to be able to acknowledge that Speaker Ryan was terrible at the job. And that, yeah, and that Pelosi will be terrible at the job, and that Boehner was terrible at the job. If you don't acknowledge that, you'll never get to um, where you need to be. And the problem with these speakers is that they have become essentially the majority leader of the party. And that's not the role of the speaker. The primary role is to be the leader of the institution and to represent all of the American people as this leader of the institution. So, you want to have a speaker who will open up the process, who will allow everyone to have their say, who will allow Republicans, Democrats, Libertarians, Independents, anyone who wants to come forward, offer amendments, and let's have a vote on it. Instead, what, what we have today is a speakership that is run very much top down. So the speaker dictates everything to everyone, and then all the legislation is take it or leave it. Here's a bill, take it or leave it. And in fact, under Speaker Ryan, we weren't allowed in the last term to even one time, not even one time, go to the House floor to amend legislation. It's the first time in our country's history, and people don't know that. First time in our country's history that members of Congress could not go to the House floor to offer amendments on any legislation. Never happened before. Um, it's what we call an open rule, where people can, can bring their ideas to the floor. So, 
Um, and we had the record, a record number of what's called closed rules, which is a take it or leave it bill. So um, the only time anyone got to offer amendments at all was when we would submit them to the rules committee, which is run by Speaker Ryan. And then he decides whether your amendment can be allowed on the House floor. Um, but of course, when that's the case, you only get really bad amendments that are allowed on the House floor, ones that they know will not pass, or amendments that don't really do anything. So you never really, we never really got to legislate. And the Speaker's job is to ensure that the House can legislate. That's the Speaker's job. And by the way, I brought this up on, on Twitter the other day. That I think is a point that's often missed, but very important. People complain about how strong the executive branch is. One of the main reasons, if not the main reason, the executive branch is so strong today is because Congress is so weak. And the reason Congress is so weak is because it's top down. If you had a Congress that was not top down, where all 435 members in the House had a say, and all 100 members of the Senate had a say, it would be very difficult for the for the president to run roughshod over Congress. Because when the president's negotiating with Congress, he then has to deal with a huge group of people, and he can't possibly dictate the outcome to them. So the speaker would say to the president, you know, give me your idea. I'll take it back to the House floor. We'll have a vote on it. And the president's not going to like that. The president's going to say, well, I just want to negotiate with you. And, and a good speaker would say, Mr. President, that's not how this works. You don't negotiate with me. I take your ideas to the House, we have a vote on it. If it passes there, it goes to the Senate, and then you get to decide. So on That's that how point, our system's supposed to work. On that point, I'm wondering, it's true, first of all. Yeah. Uh, first, a quick reminder, send me your questions. I'm not rudely checking my email, I'm reading your questions. Uh, while I read them, though, I want to ask one more of my own, which is, uh, I want to know how the generational warfare is going on the Hill, because you and I are exactly the same age, that means I am extremely old for a journalist, and you're extremely young for a congressman. <laughs> I don't know about that. But there are now, like, you know, there's some new babies on the Hill. There's yeah. some real fetuses up there. And yeah, so I'm, I like guess, an, I'm like an old man now. Yeah. So I guess I'm wondering, you know, as you watch, um, you know, hearings on social media regulation, and you get this kind of series of tubes vibe from some of the older dudes, yeah. um, you know, when, when is the changing of the guard, and what does that look like? and how angry are well, the youngs? It's hard to know. Like I said, I'm kind of the old man now. Now I'm accused of telling dad jokes all the time and stuff. So um, I think that a lot of the young people are shaking it up, um, particularly on the Democratic side. On our side, not as much. Um, there are a lot of people who come in and they um, talk a good game. Uh, you know, you have young people who come in and they'll talk a good game. But when you look at the votes, they're basically the same as the old people. Um, I think the character of the person matters a lot more than their age. I have a lot of colleagues who are older, who are very principled. Um, Walter Jones is one of them. He's a very principled man. We don't see eye to eye on everything, uh, especially there's some economic issues where we'll disagree. Um, and uh, right now, unfortunately, he's, he's not doing well. And um, he, he hasn't been to Congress this term, uh, so we're, we're thinking about him and praying for him. But. Um, you know, he's a very principled man, and he's a little bit older. Thomas Massey's older than you might expect. Um, I hope he's he not watching. He, he's not an old man or anything, but, you know, he's older than you might expect. Um, he's got that baby face. So, um, so I don't think it's all about, you know, just bringing in 20-year-olds and, like, that means everything's going to be fixed. Um, I think you have to have the right character, and that matters a lot. And at the end of the day, um, People with strong character who really um, believe in themselves, who know what they are when they run for office, they're likely to do much better than someone who's just kind of, you know, they might talk a good game, but if, they're, if they base their self-worth on what their colleagues think about them, then you'll lose them in just a week. Um, those people will sell out in a week. Uh, so on Twitter, Nathan Goodman asks about the threat the Trump administration's immigration policy poses to civil liberties. Yeah, well, I think it poses a big threat um, because, of course, first of all, for Americans um, who are of uh, Hispanic background, for example, um, there are situations where their civil rights are being violated because um, they're being asked 
um, or may be asked to produce documents and other things based on just how they look. Someone might say, well, we don't trust that you're actually from this country and um, we're going you know, to check you out. Um, I, I think that people have really lost sight, about, uh, lost sight of what this country is about. Um, this country is a place where everyone can come where uh, we obviously have laws, and laws have to be followed. And we have a system for people to come here legally. But um, whether you're a citizen or not, the Constitution protects you when you're here, when you're in the, in the United States. Uh, I often get asked whether the Constitution um, applies to non-citizens. And it, of course, the Constitution applies to the United States. You know, this distinction of citizen or non-citizen um, is not really in there in the way that a lot of people think. So, of course, citizens can vote under our, our laws, and, and there are other privileges that the Constitution grants to citizens. But uh, when, it, when we're talking about due process, when we're talking about equal protection, uh, when we're talking about how the law treats people day to day, um, everyone is treated the same way under our system. And that's what, that's what makes America great. That is one of the greatest parts of America, that we're a country with people from all backgrounds who come here, and some of them might not be citizens yet, maybe they're trying to become citizens, but we're a country with people from all backgrounds, we live together, and we, we have a system based on liberty, and um, the idea that people can live out their lives and make decisions for themselves, and our Constitution protects that. A question from uh, Hasham El-Maliki, who asks, uh, do you see common ground or potential joint efforts with uh, AOC, Ilan Omar, and Rashida Tlaib, other newly elected? Is there, have you got anything in the works with the, well, with, the, with the Dems? I can't speak to each one individually, but I, I would say that um, I do speak to a lot of um, progressive Democrats and um, some of the new ones as well. And yeah, we are talking about working together on a number of things. So um, especially civil liberties issues, um, foreign policy issues. Uh, we're going to try to have more regular meetings with them. Um, some of the House Liberty Caucus members, we're going to try to bring some of the progressives in to have these conversations. We're concerned about um, the renewal of Section 215, which is, of course, from the Patriot Act and, and the USA Freedom Act. Um, which ended up being bad the way they designed it. So that's coming up this year, so we're going to, ha we're going to have to work on that. We've been talking to them about the uh, war in Yemen. Um, we're talking to them about just wars generally, whether we should have uh, troops in Syria, why aren't we out of Afghanistan after all these years. Um, there, why? there are... Why aren't are, we out of Afghanistan after all these years? I could don't know, and there, are, there are lots of one? areas of agreement. And, and on, uh, on war issues, you will hear um, some of my uh, colleagues, especially the more neoconservative ones, who will talk about um, how we have to stay in these foreign countries forever, which is insane. Which is ins it's like um, when you try to bring your troops home from these wars, th they like raise hell, like, oh no, we can't do that. But when we go to these wars, there's barely a peep. Everyone's just cool with it. So, um, at least in Congress, they're cool with it. So, uh, this means that wars under this system where the president can put you into any war, but you can't pull out of the war, it means that the number of wars are just going to keep increasing, right? I mean, it's, it's uh, uh, leveraged in that direction then. Um, so, um, yeah, we shouldn't be in a lot of these wars. It's time to bring them home. And um, in Afghanistan, we have people who are signing up now to fight who were born after 9-11. Um, uh, it's the longest war in our country's history. Uh, I think we need to uh, really rethink uh, what we're doing. And uh, when you have a war, you should bring it to the American people. When you want to go to war, you bring it to the American people, you have a vote um, from their representatives in Congress, and you'd better have a game plan, you better know why you're there, and when you don't have uh, an existing objective to be there, you should get out. I have one final question, yeah, which this is, wrap up now? they said they, we have to get out. Up. So my last question for you out already. is, uh, I generally hate politicians a lot. Yeah, me too. I don't, 
I really hate them. I don't seem to totally hate you yet. Okay. So I'm wondering if you could just end the suspense and tell me, like, what are you going to do to break my spirit? I need to get ready. Um, nothing. No, I'm not going to break your spirit. Um, okay. I think uh, I wouldn't do that. Look, um, I, I, I care about doing the right thing, and uh, to me, that means sticking to my principles. Uh, I ran as a Hayekian libertarian. I mean, that's how I would describe myself. Uh, I'm a big um, uh, believer in F.A. Hayek and his writings. I think, um, I, I think he, strikes, he strikes just the right balance uh, for what I think. And I know you, you, you're like an anarchist, but... Um, <laughs> So you're, can like so I, maybe too. I broke your spirit right there, but no, we're still good. But now. whatever the case, um, look, I'm going to stick to who I am, and um, I think I've proven that it works in my district. I've been successful many times, and it's no secret to anyone in my district what I believe. Um, I call myself a libertarian every single time, and everyone knows that in my district. So it's, I'm not running like as a secret libertarian or anything. Um, <laughs> And, and I think it works. I think people, people want that. They want independence. They don't want you to stick to what the two parties are doing. Um, they want you to be principled. And guess what? I, I think a lot more politicians would realize this if they tried it. People will be um, very open to your principles if you stick to them and you explain what you do. Um, I think they're so scared all the time of doing the right thing and sticking to their guns. They're afraid their constituents will will um, boot them out of office, but it's just not true. Your constituents want someone who's honest and principled. I, I think that's what they really care about more than anything. Thank you very much, Congressman. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everyone. What a great way to kick off LibertyCon 2019. As a reminder, yoga and MMA start tomorrow at 8 a.m. So please hydrate yourselves. And sessions will start tomorrow morning at 9.30 a.m. Now, please join us in the back of this room for an all-conference reception, which has been provided by the folks at Facebook. Thank you.